How many people first five games? Take it out of the picture. Um, so, so you use it? Yeah, so you the donor flow, we're just going to start with a few quick announcements for people, and then we're going to get into the talks because we have a lot of talks tonight. Um, so yeah, pretty much first up, um, I'm going to do to do this, talking about the Epic Falcon Food Network. But two minutes. Um, okay, so I just wanted to very briefly talk about uh, OpenAppl, which is a, it's a project, which is, it's an online marketplace, software for running an online marketplace that connects food producers uh, through, say, local food enterprises, local food hubs, with uh, consumers who want to kind of buy online food, you know, through a local network. Uh, the project is uh, being developed by a core team, uh, being managed and developed uh, by a core team in Australia. Uh, I myself, my name is Paul Guy, I co-founded a company last year called Folk Labs um, with a focus on building uh, better, better tools for local communities and so we're working with the team, who are working on software closely to kind of bring, uh, bring it and bring it over here and help to kind of deploy it over here. Um, it's, another thing they did in Australia was they created the Open Food Foundation which is a charity that's helping to kind of manage the project. So. And there's a few kind of core principles that they tried to develop around the project in terms of what it can offer for food hubs. Uh, firstly, um, uh, networks. So it's very important at a kind of local level that you know, different food enterprises can form networks and connect. So the software's got the capability to kind of create those connections. Uh, similarly, diversity. There is no one size fits all for the, for the food system. If, if you are a regular uh, clean weight, you've probably heard some of the previous talks about uh, from the likes of food trade and farm drop. Uh, there are many, many things wrong with the food system. We need to be tackling it in a whole range of different ways. Uh, and food network's been built from the ground up to uh, support a whole diversity of different kind of uh, food enterprise models. Uh, thirdly, transparency. Uh, it's designed to kind of provide, you know, really effective transparency of kind of pricing and, and uh, food chain information from right from the producer all the way through to, to, to where the consumer's buying. And lastly, uh, additionally, um, open, you know, it's, it's a high open project, so it is open source, and this is quite different to kind of most of the projects out there. Uh, and there's you know, strong interest in the project about looking at things like open data, how we could build APIs and connect um, different platforms together. And, and I suppose lastly, just kind of looking at um, kind of the control and sort of, you know, where, where are the money in the system going and things like that. So I think, uh, you know, I mentioned it's been managed by the Open Food Foundation, it's a charity, there's a kind of, on the uh, uh, website, there's a uh, ethos of kind of non-profit, but I think really it's it's sort of looking beyond, you know, sort of looking at how is it a social enterprise going beyond the kind of for-profit, non-profit model, but saying, well, what's the best use of capital? How can we most affect create change in the food system with this? Uh, so in terms of what's happening in the project, they're running a beta in Australia. They're running. Uh, we've set up a pilot that's running with the Five Diet in uh, Scotland. That's one of the largest uh, local food projects in Europe. Uh, they're trying to kind of run up a food hub now to, to start building up increasing their income. Uh, we're also working with about uh, another five or so uh, established food hubs, many of which have already been going for, 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 for several years, but they need that better software to kind of grow the capacity and, and provide better service. Uh, and so we're hoping to kind of grow the project. And uh, if you go to the website there, so start some goods slash open food network, um, it's uh, running a crowdfunding campaign right now. Uh, it's got about 15 days left to go on that. Uh, so it would be wonderful if you would like to check out the project, if you can support it, tweet about it, promote it through any of your networks. And of course, if you like the look of what's, uh, what's been done, uh, in any support through the crowdfunding campaign itself would be fantastic. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, and on the note of food and crowdfunding, Farm Drop, who we had back here in February, are on the at the moment raising investment. They've managed to get funding, they're now overfunding. It's a really, really good project where they get um, local farmers to come like cook food in people's offices and they'll back to distribution points and you just come pick it up from there. So it's really well checked now. Uh, and Wound, wherever you disappear to, are you going to talk about the project? Hi, uh, so I'm Woon and uh, I'm currently setting up a podcast to help promote uh, clean web companies and clean web services and uh, anyone who's involved in the clean web movement, if you've uh, 
if you're interested uh, to be on the show uh, to promote yourself or your company, um, I'll be interested to find out more about uh, yeah, how, how we can sort of run an interview or uh, basically conversations, because that's, uh, that's the name of the podcast, Teamwork Conversations, and uh, it's the first episode is up, it's on iTunes, it's on Stitcher, it's, uh, you can find it on most of the uh, podcast directories out there, and the website is teamwork.tv, and yeah, uh, subscribe, listen, uh, yeah, happy to get feedback. Thank you. Um, space. 
Um, so we did a little bit of sort of maths, so if you take the whole area, if you're the only person searching, so there is a professional entomologist who built his career around looking for the new forest cicada. Um, so his name is Brian, and so you probably can't see it, but there is a little dot in the middle. Um, if you take those sort of 13 and a half million visits, that really means that everyone just has to look in the sort of few meters around them. Um, so the numbers aren't so bad, and if you sort of imagine that each of those people are actually, if you can get someone to go for sort of a 6 kilometre walk, then you're down to, you need about sort of uh, 10,000 visits to cover the whole area. So these are sort of numbers that begin to look sort of quite favourable, they, they begin to look sort of comparable to searching five European cities for one person in the city and collecting a photo within 24 hours. Um, so that was the challenge, um, and the hypothesis we had is that even though it's very hard for your for, for, for most adults to hear um, 13 to 15 kilohertz, actually it's well within the range of your phone. So your phone can hear up to 22 kilohertz very easily. They have very small MEMS microphones with very sensitive to high frequencies. So a, smart, a typical smartphone has a microphone that's very sensitive that can, that can easily hear this um, cicada, but it also has the computing power to do some recognition on, on, on board. So they, uh, the idea we had is, well, can we get people to go out with smartphones, listen, use their smartphone to listen to the cicada, produce a map of where they hear it, or give us negative reports if they don't hear it. So, so the idea is, could we use a smartphone to, uh, as a cicada detector? Um, so to test that out, we went to Slovenia, so the same species. Um, so the new forest cicada is Cicadetta montana, it's a mountain cicada. So it likes sort of, um, it likes hot countries, but it likes to be up in the mountains where it's a little bit cooler. It likes to be on south faces, so it's nice and sort of sunny. Um, so, so the new forest isn't really the best habitat for it anyway, um, but it has been there for a long time. Um, so this is much more a sort of typical environment for, for a mountain cicada, Cicadetta montana. Um, Slovenia also has sort of two world experts on, on cicada, um, so we spent a lot of time with them out in the field, them telling us how they recognised it. Um, for them, bioacoustic recognition is the way to, to find it. You're never going to find it by sort of wandering around looking, hoping to find it. You have to use some sort of bioacoustic tools, they use back detectors and, and parabolic microphones. Um, so we took a whole host of different things. Um, and the surprising thing is that the, the best thing to detect in the cicada turned out to be my iPhone 4S. Um, so you can sort of see this sort of, this is a, a, just a standard app doing a fast Fourier transform, and this big peak in here is the high frequency. And, and that click when it stops is, is someone clicking their fingers to try and apparently that attracts the cicada a little bit, the male cicada a little bit closer because the, the females click and the cicada moves a little bit closer. Um, so it turned out the best thing to actually detect this, given all this sort of technology that the experts had, was actually just holding my phone in the air and looking at this, this FFT. Um, and it really was quite amazing, you know, the, you, know you really could stand there with the phone and, and tell the experts all oh, there's one over there. Um, and they, they were a bit sort of amused. Um, and it turns out that actually sort of detecting it on the phone is relatively easy. So, so the, this is the, 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 the waveform and the sonogram of this cicada. And it has a sort of very characteristic, very strong signal here, which is about sort of 13 and a half, 14 kilohertz. It has this really interesting thing where it gets louder and louder and louder over about sort of 30 seconds. So you, you start to, to hear it, you're not quite sure you're hearing it, it's gradually getting louder and louder and louder, and then suddenly it sort of stops very, very suddenly. So, and, and at the point of it stops, you suddenly think, oh, that was one. Um, so so you, you notice when it stops, but the, because the volume sort of ramps up, you sort of, you're not quite so aware of it sort of as, it's, as it's building up. Um, so actually recognizing this is sort of relatively easy on the phone. So, so this sort of sonogram is going up to 22 kilohertz, and you're, an iPhone can record at 44 um, uh, kilohertz, so CD rate, um, it typically go up to 48 as well, so Android phones can't go up that high. Um, but it's relatively easy to to, to, to pick this and, and to spot that. Um, and there aren't that many things that, that aren't that many insects that you can sort of mistake this for. So there's lots of other stuff going on that you know you get footsteps and you get lots of wind noise, you get sort of trees sort of moving around. All that generates a lot of sort of background noise. But actually the characteristic sort of, of different insects is, is relatively sort of simple to recognise. So most of them chirp. So so this is a uh, this is a dark bush cricket has sort of very very characteristic, sort of very regular chirp every sort of second or so. Um, and you can sort of see all of these chirpings have sort of lots of very high frequency signals. So they start at about four kilohertz and then they just go up and, 
this is, this is solid gravity sort of cut off, but these, these frequencies just keep going up into the, into the ultrasonics. Um, and the thing that's one that you're most likely to confuse it with is, is this thing, which is Roselle's bush cricket. Um, so this does have this sort of very long song, so this, this typically can sort of sing continuously. If it's a little bit colder, it will sort of sing for these sort of shorter time periods, sort of 10, 20 seconds. So it's quite this, and then, so this is sort of reasonably sort of uh, similar to the cicada. It comes out a little bit later, so the cicada is sort of May, June. This is more likely July, August. Um, and the classic thing here is that the, the frequencies again just sort of keep going. So the uh, the the, the, the uh, Brazil's push cricket, the signal has lots of ultrasonics that just sort of keep going to these high frequencies. Um, and the cicada has this very strong sort of focus signal. You sort of see it's sort of chopped off a little bit to the sampling rate, but you sort of see the signal is sort of dying away as the frequency increases. So actually recognizing the, um, the, 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 the waveform of the insect is relatively easy. Um, and the other thing we had to worry about is sort of how good are the microphones on the phones. Are they all the same or do different phones have different microphones? Are they all this sensitive? Um, so we did one of sort of characterization of, of different microphones. And, and iPhones are all uniformly good. So if you've got an iPhone, you've got a good cicada detector in your pocket. Um, if you've got an Android phone, you know, some, some aren't so good. Some are, some are quite sort of insensitive. Some are very good. So this is a, this is a Nexus 4, um, which is very sensitive. You can sort of see it goes all the way out to, to uh, sort of these high frequencies, sort of 20 kilohertz. Um, and this is a Nexus 1. So this, is, this, is, this has some um, high, uh, sort of low pass filtering, so all of these high frequencies are just sort of completely absent. Uh, and this has been unfortunate because David they bought one of these to take it to Slovenia to record the new forest of Carla, um, and got there and so it didn't work at all. Um, but this is the most of these tech on the phone, so you can do some sort of self test and you can look at the frequencies and figure out that or that there's no sort of high frequency signal in here. So what we ended up with was an app, um, Android and iOS versions. Um, this is a video of it working in, in Slovenia. So what you can sort of see in the middle is a nice sort of cicada icon that lights up. You can sort of see this is actually, this is, I'm recording a survey, so this is the cicada actually singing, that very strong sort of band around the outside, this is the cicada. You can sort of see you're holding it up, uh, detecting real time, looking for these characteristic ratios of the, uh, um, of the frequencies. You can see it stopped here, so it was very, very strong and then sort of suddenly stopped here. And the light goes off. And what you should sort of see is that you then do a little bit of processing when it comes up. So, yes, you detected the cicada. So, this all gets uploaded. We have a sort of a back end server where we can sort of look at some of the reports. Um, David and I spend quite a lot of time. This thing sends us an email every time there's an upload, so we sort of we go and look at it. Um, lots of them were people playing around, pissing into the microphone, <laughs> giggling in the background. Um, some of them looked very convincing, so they actually were some real field recordings which were very convincing and looked quite like the cicada. So we had one just a couple of days ago that, that was convincing enough for us to actually to go to the site. So we, the, these are all sort of geotags and we knew the, the GPS coordinates and we went to the site and sort of surveyed the area. Um, it wasn't a, a cicada, it was a Brazil's cricket, unfortunately. Uh, but maybe it was the wind in the background, uh, it was a bit, a bit annoying. Um, but there's a sort of a back-end process to sort of go through and, and, and look at these recordings. So we, we launched this in May of last year. We had sort of lots of lots of radio coverage, so we were sort of new scientists, um, uh, BBC. New Forest National Parks were very supportive, so we had a lot of we spent a lot of time with them trying to understand some of the issues around actually deploying this in the forest. When we started the project, we wanted to be able to steer people to particular areas. We wanted to have maps of where people have gone and tell people, well, oh, go to this spot. Um, and actually that turns out to be a very sort of sensitive thing to do in the, in the New Forest or in, in, in any national park. Actually steering visitors to particular places <coughs> creates all sorts of problems. So we ended up just sort of letting people sort of go where they went um, and not actually trying to actively steer them. Uh, Bug Life is a, uh, is a UK or European charity specialising in insects um, and we provide them the tools to their entomologists and they were doing a survey at the New Forest at the same time. Um, so we ended up with we had about, uh, forget the numbers, we had uh, several thousand downloads of the app. We had about 10,000 reports uploaded. 6,000 of them were from the New Forest. So 6,000 people, or 6,000 surveys, people went out in the New Forest and uploaded it. 
Um, and unfortunately, we didn't find it. So it could still be there. So uh, um, you know, no, no evidence doesn't mean it's not there. Um, we were hoping to find it. We were hoping this year, the summer, with the weather being so hot, would be a good year. Um, when you speak to the entomologist, next year is always the, the good year. You know, it's just like now, what will be good next year? If it's raining now, what will be good next year? Um, so hopefully next year we'll have a little bit more luck. And next year actually we want to try and sort of deploy some fixed sensors as well. Um, so the actual getting people to go out with their phones worked really well. And we actually sort of, we, we managed to cover an enormous area, a very big area that actually the sort of the expert entomologists wouldn't have necessarily gone to visit. But there is still this use case where there are some sites where you'd like to have permanent monitoring. Um, so rather than actually trying to, because we, we can't really sort of steer the crowds to go and, and sample at those points regularly, uh, given the sort of concerns of the, the National Parks Authority, so we're going to try and sort of deploy some, some active monitoring. Um, so for me, this was sort of a really interesting project. You know, the first time really sort of taking stuff that we've done in, in a completely different domain and applied it in biodiversity monitoring. Um, and since then, we've done all sorts of continuation work. So we're working with the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology, building in some of our sort of recording technology into an app that's going to do recognition of all UK orthoptera. So you, if you're walking in a field and you hear a cricket, you don't know what sort of cricket it is, but this app should be able to recognise it. There's, a, there's only about sort of 20 odd species in the UK, so it's, it's not an enormous classification problem. The challenge is typically that there aren't very good libraries, um, and there aren't very good, and, and all the library recordings are done in very sort of nice conditions. But actually during the survey we generated an enormous number of live field recordings from smartphones. Um, so that's been really useful to try and do this sort of recognition. Um, so if you want to find out more, have a look at the website. Um, we're on Twitter as New Forest Cicada. Um, there's, a, there's a New Jersey Cicada who follows us and we follow them. Um, so it's a different species in New Jersey, but um, it's a small community. Um, and if you want to download the app, it's called Cicada Hunt. So you can just download it uh, on the app. Uh, IRS and, and Google Facebook. Okay, thank you. Where did the funding come from? 
Yeah, so this was so the this is an EPSRC project um, which was specifically looking at sort of doing crowdsourcing in citizen science. So we're we're really interested in in it's a it's a program grant, so it's a very big project, um, about sort of ten million the whole thing, um, which is really looking at sort of developing tools for helping people and software sort of interact. Um, so this is sort of a um, a very sort of small use case that we went all the way through. So rather than sort of focusing on one bit, it was relatively simple, one species, one place in the world, but it meant that we could do the whole thing. We could sort of do the recognition, we could build the app, we could actually get people out using it. Um, and so the, the, the algorithm that does the recognition um, was sort of being published, um, and really it's a, it's a case study of actually trying to do citizen science with bioacoustics. And was the IT side of it done within the university as well, or is that outsourced? Yeah, so we, um, so we did all the, so the, we had a, um, we worked with an app developer to do the front end, so it's a Cordova uh, frame gap HTML5 front end, um, and then we developed back, uh, native audio plugins. So the level that we're doing the recognition, we're doing it live, so we're taking samples uh, sequentially from the, from the sound card. So, so that has to work with a, as a native plugin on both of the platforms. Um, but then the, the design can be done sort of by an app developer using more standard tools. Um, so I wasn't entirely clear on what, what do we think the causes of, has there been a population decline? And if so, what do we think the causes of that are? Is it lots of conifer plantations? Is it climate change? Or is it just that the population has this cycle? Yeah, so there's no clear indicator. So, so um, climate change doesn't seem to be an argument. Maybe sort of slightly wetter winters may be, may be affecting it. Land use changes in the new forest seem to be, different grazing patterns seem to be the key thing. So the site that they knew that Cicada was at um, is very well studied and then the entomologist who studied it died. And, and in order to preserve the site, they fenced it all in, which stopped the ponies coming in and, and grazing it. So the, the, the habitat changed. Um, so, but the, the, the sort of the entomologists in Slovenia, they sort of say, well, you know, it's been there so long, it, it's got to be there somewhere. And it, it just has this habit of actually sort of being in a site for a long time and then moving on. And it has disappeared for sort of 20, 30 years in history as well. So it's thought to be extinct quite a few times and then suddenly reappeared somewhere else in the forest. Um, 